Before we start this video, I just wanted to take a moment to say that this is a monumental day for my YouTube channel. Today, I have the honor of introducing you all to a new friend of mine. He's someone that I hold near and dear to my heart, and I hope you guys like him. Everyone give a warm welcome to my new pal, Giraffe Sean. He's just like me in every way. You might be wondering, why is he a giraffe? Well, that's my favorite animal, so yeah, of course he's a giraffe. He's the official mascot of Dusk Till Sean Enterprises, and he is here to stay. Everyone go to the comments and show some love for our new giraffe friend. He loves compliments, so let him know how nice his slender neck is, or how vibrant his spots are, or whatever kind words you can muster. For real though, big shout out to Iguigo on Fiverr. I messaged him with every last fine detail, and he made it happen flawlessly. He was even able to nail the art style of the late 90s and early 2000s cartoons for Giraffe Sean, and I love it. If you're looking for an avatar for your YouTube channel, other social media, or maybe just an artist rendition of your D&D character, I highly recommend looking him up. He does an amazing job on a surprisingly fast amount of time. 10 out of 10, recommend. The Adventures of Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius ran on Nickelodeon from 2002 through 2006 and was an instant classic in my opinion. I'll say that when compared to our favorite classic 90s Nicktoons, it's definitely different but in a good way. Having aired in 2002, it was really a show that did its best to take Nicktoons into the 20th century. The animation style was different and the entire premise felt very futuristic even though it was intended to take place in current times. The way the show came to be was different from most Nicktoons as well. It all started with the feature-length made-for-theaters film Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius. After the success of the movie, Nickelodeon picked up Jimmy Neutron for a full-blown series. The show was fantastic in my opinion, but for the future of Nickelodeon, it was kind of a blessing and a curse. Though the show was great, I feel like it started an era of Nick where the quality of shows would decline. Sure, after Jimmy Neutron, there were a few great shows like Danny Phantom, My Life as a Teenage Robot, and of course Avatar The Last Airbender, but other than that, a majority of shows that would premiere would be rather mediocre or just straight trash. But then, that's just the opinion of a nostalgic millennial who was growing out of watching cartoons in 2007 when a lot of the next generation of Nicktoons were premiering. Honestly, I feel like Jimmy Neutron was the tipping point that resulted in Nickelodeon becoming the network that we know it as now, and that just kind of is what it is. I will say though, I loved many aspects about Jimmy Neutron. The characters were wacky and the storylines were generally great, but by far my most favorite aspect would have to be all of the inventions that Jimmy created. Throughout the series, we would see Jimmy creating some bizarre inventions that really contributed to the futuristic feeling of the show and overall added a certain charm to the show. That's why today, on our nostalgic walk down memory lane, we're gonna look at some of my favorite inventions created by Jimmy Neutron. Just as a disclaimer, this list isn't structured in any particular order. Like, we're not going from worst to best, except for number one. I'm definitely saving the best for last. But before I get into it, I just wanted to take a sec to say thank you so much for clicking on this video and checking out my channel. If you're not subscribed yet, I would love it if you did. I'm on the grind for 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year, and I can't do that without your help. If you are already subscribed, you're the literal best and thank you so very much. If it's your first time checking out my channel, welcome! I typically make long form videos where I talk about nostalgic cartoons mainly from the 90s and early 2000s. If that's up your alley, then you're in luck and I've got you covered. If you like this video, consider subscribing and turning on notifications so that you don't miss any of my future videos. And with that being said, let's dive right into it. First, we're gonna start with the season two episode, Men at Work. This episode begins with Jimmy talking to Carl and Sheen in his fort, asking if they brought the items that he asked them to bring. My mom's gold necklace. My grandma's gold tooth. She needs it back by lunch though. And the gold buried under our lawn in case dad gives all our money to telemarketers. Again. Jimmy says that gold has just the right melting point to power his newest invention, hover hats. They're hats that allow you to fly around at a maximum speed of 25 miles per hour. This is not the invention that we're focusing on in this episode, but it does play a part in the plot here. Carl and Sheen get chased by bees, and Jimmy uses his watch that's equipped with Bee Be Gone spray to get rid of the bees. After that, the helmets run out of power, and they all fall to the ground. <gasps> Our gold! 
It's all ashes! That was my grandmother's favorite tooth! And her only one. Oh, the equipment I'd need to make enough gold to replace this stuff oh, would take a ton of money. We can sell our bodies to science. You have to be dead to do that. Okay, Mr. Negative. Jimmy decides that in order to replace the missing gold, they need to get jobs. We get a montage of the boys looking at jobs from the newspaper, but they end up settling on getting jobs at the fast food restaurant Mick Spanky's. Good day. Are you Skeet? Hold on. Uh, yes! Okay. <clears throat> Are you interested in entering the exciting and glamorous world of fast food service? Yes! Oh, excellent! Wait a minute. Exactly how old are you guys? Eleven. Seventeen. Play seven. Copacetic. Skeet says that he's going to give them a job interview, which literally consists of him looking at them and telling them what job they're going to have. Okay, um, Specs, you look like you've done some serious deep frying in your day. No, maybe. I don't have a problem. Awesome. You shall be fried cook. Cool! What about me, Skeet? What can I be? Whoa! Your extremely grating voice is perfect for yelling out orders. You shall man the drive through window. Awesome! Skeet ends up saying that he has no use for Jimmy and can't hire him, but he decides to give Jimmy a chance and puts him on the register. Back at the Neutron house, we see Jimmy's parents up to their usual shenanigans. What do you want for lunch, Hugh? Yeah, nothing for me. I want to be as hungry as possible for tomorrow's mucho carne fiesta taco shack. Are you sure, honey? Remember what happened last year? No, oh, don't worry, El Sugar Deep Booger. With the anesthesia they have these days, you don't even know your stomach's being pumped. Well, just don't cry this time if you miss the pinata. I'm not going to miss. I've been practicing on Jorge here. Check out the swing! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you, Meanwhile, back at McSpanky's, we see the boys working as Sheen and Carl are just slaying it. May I take your order? Yes, we'll have one chicken bits and a purple flurp, one plain McSpanky burger, and I'll have a cheeseburger, no pickles, fries, and a vanilla shake. Give me a cow and an earthquake, a dancing albino with a heart condition, and a baby in a rickshaw. Charming at ya! Bow. Skeet is very impressed by Sheen and Carl's work. Then he says he's gonna go check on the slow guy, referring to Jimmy. That'll be 6.53. And 3.47's your change. <sighs> Dude, you're supposed to push the buttons with the pictures of food on them? Don't need to, Skeet. I memorized the prices and did the tax and change in my head. Oh, okay, Mr. Magic Man. I also did not hear you say big McThankies from McSpankies to the customer. Well, frankly, it struck me as cliched. What do you think about this? Don't let our food be denied you. Put our polyunsaturated fats and triglycerides inside you! Skeet ends up putting Jimmy on cleanup duty, and Skeet decides to work the register himself, which he does so very slowly. Hey dude, you missed a spot. I got it. Just a little sodium chloride. Actually dude, it's salt. That's what I said, sodium chloride. Uh, dude, that would be salt. If you don't know what salt is, maybe mop duty's too complicated for you. What size are you, small? Yeah, why? Skeet then ends up putting Jimmy in a burger costume and he sends him outside to attract more customers. Jimmy gets fed up and walks off when Cindy and Libby walk by and make fun of him. Back at the restaurant, Carl and Sheen are still slaying the burger game and Skeet is praising them for it. Dudes, I am way impressed. If only your friend Jimmy had your attitude and intelligentosity. Ooh. That's it! I'm out of here! You're quitting? But dude, you're the first guy who's had fit in a costume! I'm not quitting. Quite the opposite. I intend to show you all what I'm capable of! Later that night, we see Jimmy working on the restaurant by himself. The next day, Skeet shows up with Sheen and Carl, and they're very impressed to see how different everything is. Jimmy invented the world's first fast food restaurant that is fully automated and hygienic. Skeet, place your tongue on the scanner. <laughs> All right, I'll play along. <laughs> Mix Banky Burger with hot sauce, medium fries, small soda. Hey, that's my breakfast of choice. Of course. The computer determined your ideal order based on the configuration of your taste buds. Jimmy then shows off the automated food line. 
titanium pistons pound your burger and it's instantly cooked by nano waves, then hydroponically grown tomatoes are harvested and fries are boiled in imported oils. Skeet is left very impressed by the quality of the food that this machine pumps out. Hey Jimmy, what's CS? Customer satisfaction. If customers are happy, satisfaction goes up. If they aren't, it corrects the problem. The main computer watches everything that happens in the restaurant through that lens. Because it's self-correcting, nothing can go wrong. Nothing can go wrong. Nothing can go wrong. Customers start flooding into the restaurant to try out the new technology. A burger, fries, and shake kebab, just like back home. A pineapple burger with locale Thousand Island dressing. It's like you're inside my head. Winifred, there's something very important that I want to ask you. Are you going to finish those fries? Yeah. Mmm. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. We end up seeing Cindy and Libby begging Jimmy for a table at the restaurant. Jimmy tells them that it's gonna be a few hours wait, unless they feel like eating in the utility closet. We then see Carl outside, playing bouncer. Brown shoes with a black belt? I think not. Try the diner down the block. <laughs> the monkey's in! You, back of the line. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jimmy's parents are heading over to get some food from McSpanky's, which Jimmy's dad is really disappointed about because he wanted to eat at Taco Shack instead. No, Hugh, we're eating at McSpanky's to support Jimmy. No, wait. And just what do you expect me to do with this pinata stick? You don't answer that. Jimmy's parents show up to eat, but Jimmy's dad seems to have some trouble getting past Carl, the bouncer. My goodness, you boys have turned this place into quite the hot spot. Yep, hope you enjoy it. Um, hold up, Mr. Neutron. What? I, I'm with her. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Back it up, Chief. Hmm, yeah. Nope, sorry. Not feeling it. What do you mean? Look, don't make me spell it out, Mr. N, but your outfit just isn't saying McSpanky's to me. Hugh ends up distracting Carl as he and everyone behind him in line sneak in. He makes every excuse to leave, but Jimmy has a special table dropped in by robot arms that is set just for his parents' needs. Hugh sits at the table just talking smack about the restaurant and everything that makes Taco Shack better, which makes the customer satisfaction meter start to plummet. I still don't see what the big deal is. Taco Shack has a roaming mariachi band that plays La Cucaracha 300 times a day. And Taco Shack's salad bar has 18 types of cheese. And the waiters all have funny mustaches. Whoa, dude, the meter's heading south. What's going on? Oh, oh, and they have the best theme song. I think I'll sing it now. Taco Shack, Taco Shack. As the meter reaches its lowest point, the restaurant starts to rumble as the robotic arms start reaching down and taking away all of the tables in the restaurant. Everyone runs out in absolute fear. <laughs> What's happening here? Who cares? We're going to Taco Shack. Skeet, come on! Dude, I can't leave. I'm employee of the month. Later! I'm back from the bank. Hey, Jimmy, is the restaurant supposed to be rising off the ground? No. The giant burger-shaped restaurant flies off the ground and right over to Taco Shack, where it literally melts the restaurant with what looks like magma. No, it's too horrible! Quick, honey, turn around! I can still get the big and cheesy and pizza cloud! Jimmy is tracking the movement of McSpanky's and realizes that it's going to every restaurant in town and destroying them all one by one. Jimmy and his friends end up going face to face with the restaurant, but it's too strong for them to fight. They end up running and Jimmy continues to track the restaurant's movements. Well, that's the last fast food place in town. At least now it'll land and I can rip out its programming. Hey. Hey, what's it doing? It's headed for the supermarket! Oh no! It's not satisfied with destroying restaurants. It's gonna destroy any place that sells food. I knew a fast food restaurant that let you have it your way was just a crazy dream. Jimmy ends up concocting a plan to trick the restaurant, so he calls his robot dog Goddard and starts rearranging his taste buds. Jimmy flies up to the restaurant and tells it that he's hungry, and Goddard puts out his tongue for the restaurant to analyze his taste buds. 
Martin, four McSpanky Deluxe Burgers cooked at <gasps> 20,000 degrees Fahrenheit? A King Arthur with a hip replacement on a bed of coals? I arranged Goddard's taste buds to simulate a desire for incredibly hot food. But Spanky's has no choice but to fill that order. The only place the restaurant can get that kind of temperature is the sun. And just like that, we see the restaurant flying off into space where we assume it's gonna get destroyed by the sun. However, we later find out that the space bandits from the Astro Rubies episodes have commandeered the vessel and they go off to find the ship's captain, who they assume is Skeet due to his employee of the month picture on the wall, and that's where this episode ends. Now for the invention that we're focusing on, the fully automated McSpanky's. As we saw, Jimmy invented it due to feeling like he was being underappreciated. He wanted to prove to Skeet just how smart that he is, so he literally invented a restaurant that can do everyone's job for them. And it was really impressive too. The decor was futuristic, the streamlined kitchen was on point, and the robotic arms controlling everything were an interesting touch. The biggest thing that impressed me is without a doubt the scanner that analyzes the pattern of your taste buds to recommend the meal that you want. Like, how cool would that be to have? On those days when you just can't decide what to eat, you could simply just scan your tongue with this thing and next thing you know you're grabbing dinner at Panda Express. I feel like that was hands down the biggest selling point of this place. It's a nifty device that gets the customer involved and adds a whole new level of immersion to the experience. I will say though, I'm not too sure how sanitary it is. Jimmy says that the restaurant is fully hygienic, but people getting their tongue that close to those scanners and breathing on them can't be all too clean. Especially looking at the world from a COVID point of view, this place would have definitely gone out of business when the pandemic first hit. Nevertheless, the restaurant he invented is incredibly impressive. Imagine if this was real. Restaurant franchisees all over the world would be jumping through serious hoops to get their restaurant renovated by Jimmy. It would cut out virtually all labor costs and make just a ton of profit. However, the big issue here without a doubt is the artificial intelligence that Jimmy programmed into it. Also, why did Jimmy give the restaurant the ability to fly like a spaceship? You know good and well that the restaurant wasn't just built with jet thrusters underneath it. Jimmy definitely had to install that himself. But why? Did Jimmy plan for this to happen? I mean, he was pretty upset about Skeet treating him so bad, so I kind of wouldn't put it past him. Regardless of all that though, this restaurant is without a doubt a very impressive invention. Up next, we're going to look at a truly iconic invention from the Season 1 episode, Normal Boy. This episode would see Jimmy working on an invention called the Juice Bot 3000. Jimmy powers on the machine and it sucks up a bunch of oranges and starts freaking out. Jimmy's mom is upset at him for making such a big mess with his invention. She sends him off to school, saying, Honestly, Jimmy, sometimes I wish you weren't such a little genius. We then cut over to school, where we see Carl and Sheen playing with Ultra Lord and Robo Fiend. Get back, Ultra Lord! Don't make me pinch you! <laughs> don't make me pinch you! You know what? I don't think you're ready for this. These are intergalactic warriors, you know. So? Pinching still hurts. No, it doesn't. Ow! <laughs> Told ya. Jimmy walks up, and they can tell that there's something wrong with him. Jimmy tells them that sometimes it's a heavy burden to be a man of science. I know what you mean, Jimmy. That's why I decided early on to sabotage my highly scientific mind with cartoons and sugar. I guess it's too late for me. But can't I get just one day where being a genius doesn't mess up my whole life? Carl tries to put Jimmy's mind at ease, telling him that once everyone sees his science project that he's been working on, there will be a new genius in school. A hot dog holder? Actually, the hot dog holder deluxe, also known as the Versa Bun. It not only holds hot dogs, it is also a stylish hat. A butterfly with fat wings, a comfy seat cushion at your favorite sporting event, and as quickly as you see it right before your very eyes, it's gone. Ooh, what happened to the hot dog holder the vlog? Next up is Jimmy's turn. He shows them his magnetic polarity TV tray. Basically, he used magnets to make the plates float. 
We follow up that with Cindy's papier-mâché model of Mount Vesuvius, which the teacher, Ms. Fowl, is completely uninterested in. The entire class complains, wishing that Jimmy would just go off to college and stop making them look bad. Jimmy then gets the idea for a new invention. Gentlemen, I give you the Brain Drain 8000, the same dumbing down technology used by talk radio personalities. Jimmy says that being smart gets him in nothing but trouble, so he wants to have an average brain. He even has a plan for just in case he wants to turn his brain back into normal. Then I just reverse the polarity of the electron counterbalances in the helmet and get smart all over again. Yeah, Carl. All you gotta do is revert the polar berries to the cr cranberry electronic power person. Turn it on! Turn it on! We see him turn the brain drain to normal, but unfortunately the device malfunctions and it turns his brain into drool monkey mode. At first, Carl and Sheen think that it doesn't work, but they're proved wrong when Jimmy notices something shiny. Hey, have you guys seen my Luffy dance? <laughs> I'm Luffy, I'm Luffy, I'm Luffy, Luffy, Luffy. Normal Jimmy seems kind of stupid. Luffy, yeah, he's pretty messed up. Luffy, Luffy, Luffy. I like him. Me too. Can we keep him? We then get a montage of Carl and Sheen playing with dumb Jimmy, who they seem to enjoy a lot more than normal smart Jimmy. The next day at school, we see Jimmy in class as he fails to answer a question. Cindy ends up stepping in and answering the question correctly, but just as she's celebrating, everyone looks out the window to see a massive meteor hurling towards them. Alright children, now everyone stand in an orderly fashion as we await our imminent goal! After that, we see a limo pull up as the mayor of the city asks for Jimmy by name. Yeah, which one of you is Jimmy Neutron? He is, right here, sir. Neutron, I'm Mayor Quasar. That meteor's headed straight for town, and you, you have to help us destroy it. The rock will take a bullet to his face, head boy. Yeah, right, boys. Now on to the super safe underground bomb shelter. Okay, he just lost my vote. Everyone turns to Cindy for advice because she's the smartest kid in class now, but she doesn't know what to do. Cindy, in turn, reaches out to Jimmy, telling him to do one of his brain blasts to come up with an idea. <laughs> Barney monkey. <laughs> We're all doomed! Carl then says that he wishes Jimmy didn't make himself so dumb. Cindy hears him say that, and she decides to go right to Jimmy's lab with everyone and use the machine Jimmy used to make himself dumb to fix his brain. So, are you a big genius show off butt brain again? I'm not sure. Of course, what is genius but an artificial construct in the guise of an empirical truth? Hey, I didn't understand a word he said. He's back! Yeah. With his brain back to normal, we cut to Jimmy at the school with his rocket and he affixes the magnetic plates to it. Jimmy then flies up to the atmosphere and right towards the meteor. Thankfully, the magnets in the plates are strong enough to push the meteor off course and Jimmy successfully saves the day. He goes back down to Earth and finds his friends as they celebrate the Earth being saved. Yeah, dumb Jimmy was a lot of fun. He was loopy. I'm loopy. We're loopy. We're loopy. We're loopy. I'm loopy. You're loopy. Uh -huh. Okay, I think we should stop now. Though the magnetic plates were pretty cool, they aren't the invention that we're going to be focusing on. Instead, we're going to focus on the brain drain helmet. This thing is pretty freaking cool. Imagine being able to put the helmet on and control your IQ just by the flip of a switch. It's incredibly impressive. However, I can't help but wonder what kind of side effects an invention like this would have on the brain if it was real. I feel like if this thing did exist in real life, it would for sure give people brain tumors or something messed up like that. We would see the helmet appear again in another episode later on in the series, and that would be the season 2 episode Sheen's Brain. This episode would see Ms. Fowl's class letting out after a brutal history test. Everyone thinks the test was extremely hard, except for Sheen, who says it was a cakewalk. Quadruple F minus? Well, how's I supposed to know Orchidor wasn't the father of our country? That's what it says in the Orchidor website. Wait, didn't you write the Ultra Lord website? Your point? Oh. Ms. Fowl tells Sheen that if he fails one more test, he's going to be held back. Jimmy says that he's going to help Sheen, and he'll make sure that he isn't going to get held back. We're the three amigops! The three amigops? Yeah, well, you see, I was making us name tags, and I accidentally added a P to amigos, so... Pardon me, but my life is ending! Back at his house, Jimmy tries to help Sheen study. 
Sheen says that he always watches Ultralord when he's studying, as he sits right in front of Jimmy's TV. Jimmy turns it off, and they get right into the textbook questions. Tom has three pieces of bubble gum. If he trades all his gum to Ida for two raisins per piece, how many raisins will Tom have? What sort of idiot would trade bubble gum for raisins? That's not the point. What is he, some kind of health nut? You ask me, Tom needs counseling. And what kind of name is Ida? What's it short for? Ida preferred a different name? Sheen, concentrate! I am concentrating. Hey, look, TV. <laughs> They get a little more extreme, and they attach electrodes to Sheen's temples, and Jimmy says that for every time Sheen gets distracted, Carl's gonna administer a small shock. They get onto the questions, and Carl gets a little bit shock happy. 12 times 10. I don't like this game! Ow! Carl! <laughs> hey look, TV. This is useless! Jimmy, don't give up on me! You're my only hope! In one last ditch effort to help Sheen, Jimmy suggests that he could convert the brain drain helmet into a brain gain helmet to make Sheen smarter. Well, Sheen, how do you feel? Pretty stupid. Oh well, can't say we didn't try. No, I mean pretty stupid of you to forget the binomial expansion of a negative prime number yields its equal and opposite trigonometric value. <gasps> He spoke math! He spoke math! We then get a montage of Sheen flexing his brain muscles as he owns everyone in 3D chess, solves a Rubik's Cube with a blindfold on, and even plays the violin flawlessly. We cut to Ms. Fowl's class as she's handing out the math test that's 90% of their final grade. Sheen ends up showing up late, and before she can even finish passing out the test, Sheen has fully finished it. When everyone questions his intelligence, Sheen flexes his brain power to everyone before trying to get himself excused from class. Go ahead, mock all you want. The barbs of the tiny brain are as nothing to me. <laughs> Miss Fowl, can I be excused? No! May I not be unexcused? Y yes. Psych! <laughs> Jimmy ends up using basically the same wordplay to get himself excused as well, so he can go to his lab and work on turning the brain gain helmet back into a brain drain helmet, as Sheen's brain should have stopped growing by now. After altering the helmet, he heads straight to the candy bar, where we see Sheen at the counter with his head nearly doubled in size. Sheen, the math test is over, so it's time to turn your back to normal. I don't want to go back! I'm seeing things clearly for the first time! Besides, everyone loves the new me! No, we don't! Silence! Sheen causes the electricity to go out using just the power of his brain. Jimmy tries to convince him that he doesn't want to deal with the struggles of being a genius, but Sheen just doesn't listen. Don't come any closer, Neutron! Butch! Nick! Grab him! You disappoint me, Jimmy. <laughs> We see Sheen as he ascends into his ultimate form. He fires a lightning ball through the roof as he flies off. Jimmy and Carl go off to Jimmy's lab. Jimmy's computer Vox determines that the brain gain helmet has the potential to grow his IQ to infinity. Wow, he'll be really good at board games. No, Carl, you don't understand. Sheen's brain is programmed to keep growing. If we don't get that brain drain helmet on him soon, his head will explode. Ah! We see Sheen floating through the town, looking all evil and destroying stuff with the power of his brain. He molds a statue in the park to the shape of a throne for him to float on. Attention, Retroville! I said... Attention, Retroville! Don't be alarmed! Unless you find it alarming that I'm declaring myself supreme overlord of the town, in which case, be very alarmed! Oh, no. Sheen declares that he will be claiming Libby as his queen, to which she refuses, but once Sheen brings up fine robes and jewelry, Libby is immediately on board. We cut back to Jimmy and Carl, who are working on their plan to get the helmet on Sheen. We then see them approach him. We have brought you a magnificent crown, crafted from the finest semi-precious metals to celebrate your glorious reign! Hmm. It is rather fetching. Bestow it on my head! Not you, Carl. Baby llamas in the meadow. Baby llamas in the meadow. Oh no, one of them's escaping. He's heading towards town. Town rhymes with crown. Jimmy and I disguised the brain drain helmet as a crown. I heard that. 
Sheen ends up getting angry at them and he throws lightning beams at them. Sheen then proceeds to turn the ground Jimmy and Carl are standing on into quicksand. As they start sinking, Jimmy tells Carl to reach into his backpack and to grab his shrink ray. Carl uses it on a nearby light post, bringing it low enough so that he can pull himself out while Jimmy holds onto his legs. Bravo. Very impressive. You've had your fun, Sheen. Now let us go. Yeah, just let them go, Sheen. Hmm, I do grow bored. Perhaps it is time I spare you. Spare. <laughs> Get it? It's a pun. Jimmy and Carl talk about what they're going to do next, and Jimmy realizes that somewhere deep inside that brain is the old Sheen, and they need to try to reach him. Greetings, one called Sheen! Ultra Lord! Left! Right! Left! Okay! Stop, Carl! Is it really you? You <laughs> betcha! Sheen doubts the validity of this Ultra Lord, so he decides to ask him questions that only the real Ultra Lord would know. What did Rebel Fiend say when you blasted him with your ion ray? <laughs> ow! Yeah! That's right! He said, ow! Yeah! You are Ultra Lord! Join me, Ultra Lord! With my brains and your magna cannons, we'll rule the universe! Ultra Lord tells Sheen that he needs him to drain his brain if he wants to join him. Sheen doesn't like that, and he decides to smite Ultra Lord. Put it on! You dare to honor me? Feel the wrath of my brain fall! Jimmy and Carl, what have I done? I've lost my two best friends in the world. After nearly killing his best friends, Sheen decides that he can't keep going on like this, and he uses the brain drain helmet on himself to go back to normal, and we see his head shrink back down to normal size. Sheen runs up to Jimmy and tells him that he learned a valuable lesson today. You mean about how friendship is an immutable bond that can weather even the harshest storm? Yeah, something like that. So how do I get to keep the costume? Ow! That hurt! Ow! That hurt! Maybe it's worn off by now. Ow! That hurt! Ow! That hurt! We then cut back to Ms. Fowl's class, where class is getting let out and Jimmy invites Sheen to come over and watch TV, but Sheen says that he got a job offer and he really needs the money. We cut over to the Retroville University, where we see this happen. Hello, and welcome to Advanced Chemical Engineering. My name's Professor Sheen, and I shall be learning you today. This episode is truly an example of just what the brain drain slash brain gain helmet is capable of. This thing can essentially grow or shrink your IQ on command. However, it has the potential to malfunction, which at this point we've seen it do more often than we've seen it actually work properly. In the first episode with it, we see it malfunction and turn Jimmy into drool monkey levels of dumb, and in this last episode we see it malfunction and send Sheen's brain into infinite growth mode, straight up giving him superpowers and turning him essentially into a higher being. Being. I feel like this invention is one that truly has some major potential if it wasn't for the constant malfunctions. With a little more tweaking, this thing could potentially be a world changing invention, if only Jimmy could work out the bugs. Moving on from there, we're going to check out the season 1 episode, Ah! Wilderness. This episode starts out with Jimmy's dad dressed up as a scout leader as he talks about how great wilderness is. Hey, hey, honey, come on, put your back into it. <clears throat> okay, dear. All packed. Thanks, sugar booger. Oh, this is gonna be the best camping trip ever. Boys, are you ready to move out? We then see Sheen and Carl walking out of the house while they're asking Jimmy about why they have to go camping with him, and Jimmy tells them, Because if you don't, I'll be forced to publish these photos of you guys playing with Pomona Beach Debbie dolls. Pomona Beach Debbie is an action figure. She possesses super mutant powers which can defeat any adversary except Ultra Lord, of course. I like the pretty bathing suits. He starts going through the car and throwing out necessities that he says are just luxuries that'll just weigh them down. He was confident that with his experience from being an acorn lad when he was a kid that he'll be able to handle it all. I remember everything I've ever learned. You like the song that we used to sing? We are the acorn lads, something, something, the acorn lads. Come on, Goddard! No, no, no! 
No technology at all on this trip. Hugh and the boys drive off as Jimmy's mom is super excited to finally get some alone time. They arrive at what Hugh claims is going to be their campsite. Well, look, here we are. Dad, this isn't the campground. Yeah, campgrounds are for tenderfoots, Jimbo. What with their fancy run water and first aid kits and adequate lighting. Oh no, we are headed deep into the untamed wild. Jimmy's friends seem worried, but Jimmy puts their mind at ease, telling them that he has a special invention that'll help them survive this trip. We then get a nice montage of Hugh, Jimmy, Carl, and Sheen walking through the forest and climbing a cliff until Jimmy finally realizes that they've walked through the same bog four times now. Dad, I think we're lost. <laughs> lost, are we? Oh, no. This is my old secret campsite. Or close enough, it's got trees and rocks and stuff. Yeah, you boys set up camp. I go bring back fire. See you later, Bye bye Hugh leaves the boys to set up as he goes off to fetch some firewood. Then, Jimmy breaks out his new invention, the Neutron Camp in a Box. It's every convenience you could wish for in a stark wilderness setting. Observe. Wow! Cool! The Camp in a Box consists of everything they could possibly want, including recliners, a TV, and even a personal butler to tend to their every need. We then see Hugh struggling to make fire as he rubs two turtles together. Hugh then overhears the sound of the boys enjoying their campsite, and he goes up to confront them. Jimbo! What have you done? Dad, you're back already! I, I can explain! No need, son! I can see for myself! You did a great job setting up this campsite. Oh, I did? Well, a little flashy for my taste, but it looks like you got the old wilderness jeans after all. Then, when the butler shows up to serve them, Hugh realizes what's going on and that Jimmy didn't actually set up all the stuff on his own, so he pulls the plug on everything. Of course, removing the power pack while the core is still active will lead to a catastrophic meltdown in five, four, three... Run! No! Will you be needing anything else, sir? Our oh, camp! Our equipment! Everything's gone! <laughs> We're doomed! Hugh tells the boys not to worry because he can use his wilderness skills to get them back to the car. We then get a montage of Hugh walking around and using coin tosses, tasting soil, and doing eeny meeny miny mo to decide which direction to go. Finally, once everybody is thoroughly lost, Hugh admits the truth about his wilderness skills. We're done for it! It's all my fault! The truth is I'm a rotten camper! There! I said it! The other acorn lads used to dunk my head in the bug juice! I can't even make a stupid fire. Jimmy tells his dad that it's okay and that they're gonna work together to find their way out of the forest. Just then, a massive bear shows up and they all end up running away to try to escape the bear. Then, they end up getting cornered by the bear. Who knew it would end like this? Trapped between these bright yellow rocks and these clear sparkly ones. Yellow? Why, that's sulfur! And this is phosphorus! Dad, that's it! We can still save ourselves by making a fire from the natural elements around us! Jimmy and his friends distract the bear while Hugh uses the rocks to make a fire and scare it away. The pointy tip of the food chain. Gaze upon my opposable thumbs and tremble. <laughs> yeah, they hate it when you mention the thumbs. The bear ends up batting away the fire, and just then Goddard shows up to save the day. Turns out that Goddard detected the high levels of radiation from the explosion, and Jimmy's mom decided to come find them using the tracking chip that she put under her husband's skin. We then cut back to the boys and Jimmy's parents sitting in the backyard enjoying Jimmy's camp in a box. It's just like I intended. Our little nature experience has brought us all closer together. Yeah, we ought to rough it more often. Your diet flirp, sir. I love the outdoors. Alright, so the Neutron Camp in a Box is by far one of my favorite inventions. I would love to take this thing camping, or just use it to chill in the backyard like they did in the end. When it comes to camping, I'm not really picky to be honest. I'm fine with the basics out in Mother Nature, or being on a campsite that has bathrooms. 
Either way, I totally don't mind, that's just me personally, but this would take camping to the next level. This thing has all of the bougie extras. You can be waited on hand and foot by the butler that can make you literally any food you want, kick back in a nice comfy recliner, and play some old school Nintendo. This thing has it all. The invention seriously has a ton of potential too. Like, imagine if you moved into a new house or an apartment and you could use this little box to set up all of your furniture and stuff, you'd even have a butler to clean up after you and to make food. The only thing to be weary of is unplugging it because it'll apparently nuke your entire neighborhood. I gotta say though, the more I watch these episodes, the more I realize that Jimmy could have been a millionaire with some of these inventions that he comes up with. This one would be a massive hit if it was commercially available. I know I'd buy one for sure. Up next, we're gonna check out an episode that I've talked about in a different video, but I can't not bring up the invention featured in this episode. We're looking at the Season 1 episode, Ultra Sheen. This episode begins with Sheen and Carl walking down the street arguing about where baloney comes from. I'm telling you, baloney is made by tiny baloney elves. And I'm telling you, baloney grows on mighty baloney trees. Does not. Does too. Then Goddard shows up and Jimmy talks to them through him asking them to come over with their favorite video game. Then Sheen immediately just shows up before Jimmy can finish his sentence. Hey, how'd you get here so quick? I already had a copy of Ultralar vs. Robofiend Mega Battle in my pocket. And you carry that around all the time? Uh, I don't need to. I can stop whenever I want. I don't have a problem! Jimmy then asks Sheen how he would like to fight side by side with Ultra Lord live and in person. Sheen is just absolutely awestruck when Jimmy shows him his new invention, the Neutronic Game Period, that will insert you directly into any video game that you put into it. So as soon as Carl gets here- No! No! I want to fight side by side with Ultra Lord now! Please, Jimmy, every moment I'm not fighting side by side with Ultra Lord is tearing me apart! Okay, okay, okay! Sheen puts in the game and stands on the pad as Jimmy tells him that since it's a prototype, he's going to need to beat the game in order to get out. Sheen meets Ultra Lord and is too busy fangirling to help him beat Robofiend. Would you like to be my battle buddy? B -b -b battle buddy? M me? Answer quickly! My ultra senses tell me that Robofiend is approaching! At last! My long years of watching TV have paid off! Let evil tremble, for none can withstand the awesome might that is Ultra Lord and his new battle buddy, Ultra Sheen! Jimmy decides that he's going to reset the game and go in to help Sheen beat the level to get him out. As they prepare to help Ultra Lord beat Robofiend, we cut to Carl struggling to pick his favorite game. Oh, uh, my favorite video game? Oh, no, 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 it's too much pressure. Ninja Llamas in space? Uh, no, Llama versus Mega Dingo? Uh, of course, Llama Palooza! Oh, I love you most of all. We then cut back to Jimmy, Sheen, and Ultra Lord fighting Robofiend together. Sheen ends up ninjaing his way behind Robofiend and flipping his off switch and beating him. After they've won, Carl shows up. Robofiend Mega Battle featuring Jimmy and Sheen! This must be the surprise Jimmy had. Hey Jimmy, where are you? Can I play your new game? I guess he went to the little inventor's room. Well, I'm sure he won't mind. Level one? Come on, that's for babies. <laughs> Let's try level seven. The game resets by Carl's doing, and Jimmy's confused when they didn't get taken out of the game, thinking that the game reset itself. With Robofiend being at level seven, it's now a lot harder for them to beat him. Something's wrong! Robofiend doesn't get a magma cannon until level five. Someone must have raised the game level. But who? Carl! Wow! The characters know my name! Talk about interactive! Carl decides that Ultra Lord's shield is way too strong, so he decides to manually drain it, leaving Jimmy and Sheen defenseless as Ultra Lord is defeated. Oh yeah! I'm bad! I defeated Ultra Lord! And yet, I feel strangely empty inside. Maybe it's cause this game doesn't have any llamas? Jimmy gets the idea to have Sheen distract Robofiend as he goes looking for a secret hidden Ultra Crystal. Jimmy finds one and he throws it to Sheen, but Sheen drops it and Robofiend catches it, turning him way bigger and a lot more dangerous. 
Meanwhile, Ah, I'm a Perusia. Now, face the fury of my Optiblasts! What the? Shane, where are we? Jimmy ends up finding another Ultra Crystal, and he throws it to Sheen, giving him the power to beat Robofiend using his top secret weakness. Sheen knows deep in all of his Ultra Lord lore that Robofiend is lactose intolerant, so he sprays him with llama milk, which makes Robofiend explode. Well done, battle buddies! Join me again next time in the never-ending battle against evil! Arg! Jimmy and Sheen get teleported out of the game, having beaten it. Phew! There's no way I'm ever, ever playing that game again till next week. Well, I guess my prototype needs a little more work. It's a good thing you came through with those llamas, Carl. You know we... we... Carl? Jimmy, look! Llama Palooza! Llama Palooza! Yay! We've got to get him out right away! Maybe we'll just let him stay there till after lunch. Okay. Got any baloney? <laughs> this invention might be my personal all-time favorite invention from this show. I'm a huge gamer and I'd love something like this. I'm really into VR and it's cool and all, but actually getting into a video game would be so insane. I've been playing a ton of Elden Ring recently and I can't imagine being dropped into that game. Like straight up, I'd be screwed because it's so hard and there's no way I could actually beat the game as myself in there, but it would be a good time. Maybe something like Animal Crossing though, or like Super Mario 64. I feel like actually being in those games would be a good ass time. Again, this is another invention that would easily make Jimmy a millionaire, especially if Jimmy could figure out a way to get out of the game without needing to beat the game. That would be epic and I for one would definitely use the hell out of this invention. Moving on from there, we're going to check out the Season 1 episode, Crunch Time. This episode starts out with Jimmy in the lab and Carl doing an experiment with him. There are two doors. One has a piece of cheese behind it and the other has a battery attached to the knob which shocks you when you touch it. Carl is on his 76th try and still has yet to remember which one has the cheese behind it. Eeny, meeny, miny. <laughs> My turn! My turn! I want to touch the shocky door again! Jimmy decides that they should take a break and go over to the candy bar. When they get there, Sheen and Carl are very indecisive as they struggle to pick out a candy to eat. Sam is just going nuts trying to help them. I wish there was a candy that had all the best tastes! Yeah, it'd be sweet and sour and nutty and gummy and creamy and Donner and Blitz and- mega candy, huh? I can invent that! Come on, guys! Yeah, go ahead. Make your fancy candy. Yeah, you'll be back. They all come back. Oh, I hope they come back. <laughs> Jimmy decides that he's going to try and make a candy with all of the different flavors. We cut to Jimmy in his lab where he has different test tubes labeled with different textures and flavors as he tries to make a candy that'll maximize the use of all the tongue's pleasure receptors. Don't Sheen, that's concentrated essence of sour! Don't worry, Jimmy. They haven't invented the sour that's too sour for the Sheen. I stand corrected. Jimmy ends up using his device that connects to the test tubes and looks like a keyboard to mix a concoction that he hopes will result in the perfect candy. We see many failed attempts that range from just plain tasting bad, making his test subjects grow beards, and making them explode. Jimmy then says that he's going to keep at it even if it takes all night as Sheen and Carl make excuses to go home. Jimmy works on the project all night, then in the morning we see him pulling out the final product, which appears to be purple balls covered with little yellow bumps on them. Jimmy takes them to school, planning to share them with Carl and Sheen at lunch. Guys, guys, I need one last batch. We can try them at lunch. Who's making that noise? It sounds like candy inside a paper bag. Jimmy, I hope you brought enough treats for the entire class. Well, not exactly. I the entire class agrees that Jimmy's candy is the best thing that they have ever tasted. Later on, we see Jimmy in the lab finishing up his second batch as his mom calls him to go to bed. Shane, Carl, what are you doing? It's two o'clock in the morning. 
we just happen to be in the neighborhood. Yeah, uh, you, uh, you got any c c c candy? I'm making some now, but I told you it takes a while. You have to neutralize the sugar and pectin during the gestation period and- How long? Uh, about three hours. Three hours! Oh. All of Jimmy's classmates are outside trying to bribe him for more candy. Jimmy realizes that his candy is basically addictive and he decides to exploit that to his fullest advantage. We see him getting waited on hand and foot, treating his teacher like a dog, and throwing out candy at lunch. Last piece for today! Who wants it? Uh, all I brought. No more till uh, tomorrow! Everyone straight up chases Jimmy home, and he goes inside to find his parents fighting over his candy as they demand more from him. We then see Jimmy in his lab throwing all of his candy into the sewer. After that, we see an angry mob formed, including Jimmy's parents, ready to hold him down and force him to make more candy. Jimmy uses Goddard's chopper mode to help him get away. He tells Goddard to take him to the most deserted place in town, which just so happens to be the candy bar, which has been basically put out of business due to Jimmy making the greatest candy in the world. Oh, what am I gonna do? Think, think, think. Jimmy decides that he's going to try and train the angry mob like lab rats as he tells Sam to keep everyone there and that he'll be right back. Yeah, yeah, settle down. Jimmy will be right back. In the meantime, let's have a little chat with my good friend Professor Handy. Professor? Hello, Implix! Settle down! <laughs> Jimmy then proceeds to fly over the candy bar using a hose to spray his candy down upon everyone. However, this time, instead of being the normal candy that they're used to, it's infused with electricity which ends up shocking everyone's mouths, causing them to not like the candy. We cut to Jimmy sitting on the steps of his school, talking to Carl about how the garbage cans in town are just filled with Jimmy's candy. I know, isn't it great? Looks like everyone in Retroville is back to normal. Hey Jimmy! That last batch was delicious! Also incredibly painful. Hey, do you guys smell smoke? I can't feel my face! How come everything looks blue? This is an idea that really resonated with me personally. I love candy, and the idea of taking all of the best flavors and textures represented in one single candy sounds mind-blowing. It kind of reminds me of the gum from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory that simulates the flavors of eating a full course meal. What I'm curious about though is, what does it taste like? I totally get that it's intended to stimulate the part of the tongue that reacts to these specific flavors, but like, what exactly are you tasting when you eat it? Also, the idea of incorporating different texture sensations is just a little bit off-putting. Looking at the vials that Jimmy uses to create them, we see chewy, crunchy, gummy, munchy, and meaty? More than anything, I'm just really curious as to what sensations you experience when you eat this. Obviously, it must be outstanding considering that everyone was straight up addicted to it. I'm just so intrigued. It also falls in line with like the feeling of how cartoon food just looks so good. Like the pizza from a Goofy movie, or like all of the food from Spirited Away, or any other Studio Ghibli film for that matter. This candy looks so good and I would love to try it. Jimmy definitely could have sold this in stores and easily become like Jeff Bezos level of rich. Now we're gonna go check out the season 1 episode, Sleepless in Retroville. This episode starts out with Carl and Sheen walking up to Jimmy's house. Hi Mr. Neutron, we're here! You ready for us? Sleeping bags? Toothbrushes? You're moving in! Oh! No! Two more mouths to feed! Braces! College! Honey! Calm down, Hugh! They're just here for Jimmy's sleepover! Oh! 
Well, that's not nearly as bad. Jimmy brings Carl and Sheen inside, saying that this is going to be the greatest sleepover ever. He introduces them to his brand new invention, the Slumbertron 9000. Designed to throw the ultimate sleepover party. It provides the world's greatest made-to-order pizza, tells super scary stories, and supplies the perfect pillows for ultimate pillow fights! Ta -da -da! They decide to start out the slumber party with a pillow fight, and after they're all worn out, they move on to order a pizza from the Slumbertron. Gentlemen, let the gorging begin! Oh, oh my stomach! Oh, uh, stomach full, room spinning! I will eat no more forever! He who comes downstairs to tell them to go to bed, but when he catches sight of a slice of pizza, he completely forgets what he was down there doing, and he walks off telling them to have a good time. The boys then move on to a spooky story from the Slumbertron. Good evening, I am Dr. Dark, teller of terrible tales. Hold up, do you mean terrible like lousy or terrible like scary? Scary! Got it! Once, there was a monster who only appeared at night, at sleepovers, and he was called the Sleepover Monster. He tells them that the monster only comes out at night because the sun is his mortal enemy and how he likes to eat children the same age as the boys. Jimmy and his friends get freaked out, so they decide to turn off the story and they go to bed. Wait a minute! Who said anything about going to sleep? What are we, a bunch of babies? Come on, I'm gonna stay up all night! Party! 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 Carl wakes up in the middle of the night hungry, and he decides to wake up Jimmy to make more pizza, but when Jimmy doesn't wake up, he takes the matter into his own hands. I want pizza. Love, Carl. Hmm. Maybe if I just push everything... Ah! Good! Jimmy! Jimmy! Jimmy and Sheen wake up as the machine starts to freak out, but then it spits out a giant pizza. <laughs> Let's eat! Ah! The Slumbertron must have combined the pizza and scary story programs to create... A PIZZA MONSTER! Ah! Jimmy tries to delete the pizza, but the screen is frozen, preventing Jimmy from getting rid of the monster. The boys decide to split up and run off, as the pizza cuts itself into three slices and chases after them. Jimmy's parents wake up to the sound of them freaking out, and Jimmy's mom sends Hugh out to tell them to be quiet. <laughs> Hate to be a party pooper, boy, but can you keep it down a smidgen? Thank you. What's going on out there? Oh, nothing. The boys are just being chased by giant slices of flying pizza. Jimmy's parents come down to investigate, but then the machine spits out some evil pillows that start chasing them upstairs. Jimmy and his friends lock themselves in a closet, and Jimmy concocts a plan. He remembers that the sun is the monster's mortal enemy, and he plans to make it seem like the sun is rising to scare the monster. Good morning, Retroville. It's 6 a.m. 72 degrees. We got a beautiful sunrise out. We've also got a jackknife tractor trailer on the 101. Marshmallows everywhere. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. We're all They trap the monster in the pizza box and take it outside when the sun rises, and they open it, allowing the sun to defeat the monster. Just as they go to eat the pizza, the monster comes back to life. I'm starving! Let's eat! Ah! Fools! Haven't you ever heard of sequels? Ah! Things get a little confusing from there. Turns out the whole thing was Jimmy having a nightmare, inside of his dad's nightmare, inside of Carl's nightmare, inside of Sheen's nightmare, inside of the pizza's nightmare. Ah! Honey, oh, what is it? Oh, I had the most horrible dream. There were three terrible children. A tubby one, a manic one, and one with a giant head. I told you, dear. There's no such thing as children. Now, go back to sleep. <gasps> this episode really brings me back to my childhood. I remember having my friends come over to my house for sleepovers, and we would stay up all night just fooling around, playing video games, and doing dumb stuff. 
If we had something like this, it would have made the sleepovers way more fun. Maybe swap out the pillow fights for some other game, but other than that, it'd be an awesome time. Jimmy could have potentially made the machine a little more foolproof so that Carl couldn't have spawned a giant pizza monster, but other than that, this thing is legit. I can't help but think about the mechanics of it all though. This thing provides the perfect pillows for pillow fights, so does it actually make the pillows, or did Jimmy just put pillows inside of this thing so that it can dispense them? As far as the pizza goes, this thing must be full of all the toppings and have a built-in oven for cooking it. And for the scary story, of course, it's programmed with AI and a hologram to tell the story, I feel like this invention is one with serious potential. There are so many other things that he could have programmed this thing to do, and all in all, it was pretty cool. This is also one of my favorite episodes of the show, so that might contribute to how much I love this invention. Moving along from there, we're going to check out the Season 1 episode, Birth of a Salesman. This episode starts out with Jimmy showing everyone a new invention. The greatest thing your eyes have ever beheld. A llama? No. A baby llama? No. A baby llama with a little head on? No! An invention of yours that actually works? No! <laughs> I mean, yes! Jimmy shows off his new invention, Book Gum, that just from chewing it will give you all of the knowledge on an entire book. The kids take turns chewing pieces of the gum as they start quoting the books that they ate. Carl goes to eat a handful of gum, and Jimmy tells him that it would be dangerous to eat more than one piece. We then cut to class, where Mrs. Fowl is telling them that the class is having a candy selling contest, and the grand prize is a trip to the Retroville theme park. Forget it! I am winning this contest! Yes! Cindy won the Girl Club Cookie Selling Contest three years in a row! And I could have won three more times, but they forced me to retire those merit badge grabbing cookie loving. Aw, that's a cute story, girls. Jimmy insists that he's gonna win, as does Cindy, so of course they take the competition very personally. Later on, we see Jimmy at the dinner table talking to his parents about the contest, and his dad starts giving him advice on how to be a good door-to-door -door salesman. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's me. Well, come on in. Good evening, ma'am. Want to spice up your life? Sure. Yeah, well, then what you need is this beautiful four-pronged eating implement. Mm, but, sir, I already have one. I can see. But can yours talk? Mm, yeah. My name is Forky. You're pretty. <laughs> Buy me. <laughs> Buy me. Oh, I'll take four. <laughs> <laughs> and that, Jimmy, is how where I got to be where I am today. I can't help but point this out, but in this scene, I'm pretty sure they're just eating straight canned cranberry sauce for dinner. We then see Jimmy going door to door trying to sell chocolate. Oh. What can I do for you, Sonny? Greetings, potential buyer. I would like to show you the psychological and physical advantages of buying and later ingesting chocolate-based products through your oral cavity. Unfortunately, Jimmy's approach is very unsuccessful. We see him standing outside on the curb, wondering why no one's buying his products, but then Cindy and Libby walk up and make fun of him as Cindy says that she's going to show him how it's done. The Vortex family would consider it a great honor if you were to buy a case of this delicious candy. Forget about it. I ain't buying nothing. That's a very beautiful horse. It would be unfortunate for him to have an accident. Capiche? Oh no, not chestnut. I'll take ten cases. Jimmy ends up realizing that selling door to door isn't about the superior intellect. It's about manipulating emotions with shallow behavior. Jimmy ends up brainstorming with Goddard, and he gets the idea to build a better salesman. The Willy Lawman 3000, a super selling machine programmed to make the sale at any cost. He will not take no for an answer. <laughs> We see Jimmy and his friends relaxing as the robot knocks on doors selling candy. As Jimmy said, it's programmed not to take no for an answer, so naturally it does anything possible to force the sale to happen. How about if I throw in this free dog if you buy a box? <laughs> hmm, what kind of dog is he? He's your kind of dog, congratulations! Hey, what does he eat? What, what, oh, oh, not on the carpet! What, ooh, are those blood nuts? The robot goes back to Jimmy, having sold a thousand boxes of candy. Jimmy goes off to gloat to Cindy. Meanwhile, the robot tries to sell Sheen and Carl some candy, offering Jimmy's rocket for free if they purchase a box. Oh, no, 
Nerdtron. But isn't that your stupid jetpack that someone is putting in the back of their truck? <gasps> Puke and Pluto! Jimmy runs over to his robot, and he figures out that the robot's giving away all of his stuff. Mechanical bird! You, you gave away Goddard? But you can't just... You... How, how much do I hear for this strapping young lad? Large of head, head broad of brain. I'll give you 25 cents! What, 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 what are you... What are... 25 cents? I'm worth at least... 50 cents! Shane! Sorry, Jimmy! I always wanted to buy her since I was five years old! And the bid is 50 cents! 50 cents! As the robot's trying to sell Jimmy to the highest bidder, Jimmy does a brain blast and gets the idea to offer the robot some pieces of free gum. The robot eats a few pieces, and he starts to malfunction. Yeah, did you say free? Once upon a time, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And I'm injury, my dear Watson. Pop on, Pop. You're the sorcerer, sorcerer, Harry. I'm sorry, you stay away from that. Danger. I thought the white person down the house. Men are from Mars. Danger. Jimmy Neutron. Rally. Danger. Literature overload. Lit lit literature overload. One car. You're off the line. Danger. Jimmy Neutron. Danger. Thank you. Danger. 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 The next day at school, we see Ms. Fowl reading out the contest results, and we find out that Cindy and Jimmy tied, forcing them to go to Retroland together. I demand a recount! I demand a transfer to another school! I am not having fun. Neither am I, Nerdtron. You want some gum? No! First of all, I can totally relate to this episode. I'm not proud of admitting this, but once upon a time before COVID, I was a door-to-door -door salesman for a massive company, and I know exactly what it's like to have to knock on doors and try to sell people who don't want to even see your face. However, I will say that the Willy Loman 3000 is not the invention that we're going to talk about. Even though he played a massive role in this episode, no, he kind of sucks, actually. Instead, we're focusing on the book guy. This stuff is incredible. Imagine being able to chew on some gum and obtain immediate knowledge on a topic. The possibilities are endless. There's so much that I would learn if this was real. Imagine being able to chew the Chilton's manual for your car and being able to do basically any repair by memory. Or imagine being the DM for your D&D group and chewing the campaign book and immediately having the whole thing memorized. There's so much more that you could do with this and I wish so hard that this could be a real thing. As someone who isn't the biggest fan of reading, I would for sure abuse the hell out of this gum and chew as many books as I possibly could, but not at the same time, of course. Up next, we're going to focus on the Season 1 episode, Journey to the Center of Carl. This episode starts out with Jimmy at home showing Goddard his greatest invention ever. The Neutronic Sick Patch, guaranteed to get you out of school for the day. <laughs> Don't worry, Goddard. Watch this. Jimmy! Jimmy's mom comes upstairs and sees him looking awful and tells him to get into bed and relax instead of going to school. Jimmy's parents have to go to work, so Jimmy gets to stay home by himself all day. Here's today's homework, Jimmy. Gee... You look really sick. Yeah, you look like you have berry berry fever. Have you been eating any berries that were foaming at the mouth? Actually, guys, <laughs> I'm not sick. The Neutronic Sick Patch. You're only sick when you wear it. Carl and Sheen insist that they want to get patched up. Cindy and Libby over here, and they decide that they need patches too. Okay, but don't tell anybody else. After everyone gets their patches, we see Ms. Fowl at school with an empty classroom, pretending to be the students. How do clouds create rain, Carl? Um, well, when the clouds get very sad, they cry. No, Carl! Jimmy! Water vapor condenses on a particle called a condensation nucleus. 
Got a blast! Meanwhile, everyone is living the life, sitting at home and being sick, but as Jimmy's on the phone with his friends, Hugh comes in deciding that he's gonna homeschool Jimmy while he's stuck at home. We then get a glimpse at what the other kids are going through as Cindy is getting acupuncture from her mom, Carl is in a large plastic bubble, and Libby's getting a wasp thing to the forehead, meanwhile Sheen is getting the old pepper up the nose cure. Your hip bone's connected to your, your bone next to it. That bone's connected to the good Jimmy, what's the bone in your knee? This one right here. I can't take it anymore. It's time for this kid to get well. Get down, bend the knee, bend the knee, and touch the sky. Just when Jimmy gets fed up and wants to take off the patch, we see it dissolve into his skin. Meanwhile, all of the other kids call Jimmy, letting him know that the same exact thing happened to them. Jimmy asks Sheen and Carl to meet him in his lab. Jimmy explains that the sick patch has dissolved into their bloodstream and that they'll be sick forever unless Jimmy can get to the mitochondria from the virus to make the vaccine. To do that, two of us will have to shrink to microbe size and travel inside one of you guys. I volunteer! Carl, to be the person we go inside of. I second it! Hey, wait a minute! Jimmy and Sheen shrink down as they use Jimmy's hover car to get into Carl's body. They enter through his nose and make their way into his head to his brain. Look! There's Carl's brain! Where? I don't see it. Is it behind that wand on a stick? Um, well, actually... Oh. I got people inside! <laughs> I got people inside me! They make their way down into Carl's stomach, where Jimmy finds the germ that they're looking for. Jimmy grabs it and it screams, when all the other germs come to the defense of their germ brother. Do something else! How about some impressions? Emmy T! Okay, uh, I'll be back. Here's Johnny, you dirty rat! That's all, folks! Uh, do you do anything besides impressions? I used to dance in my younger days. When none of that works, Jimmy decides to get Sheen to cry because germs are attracted to saline, which exists in tears. When he starts crying, all of the germs run away from Jimmy as they make a quick escape. How do we get out of here? Through the nearest exit! Do you have a plan B, perhaps? Oh, we could always pull up Pinocchio! We're gonna turn to puppets? <laughs> no, but if we had something to make Carl sneeze like the whale and Pinocchio, we would get out. Sheen decides that he's gonna break out the pepper and make Carl sneeze so that they can get launched out through his nose instead of going through his butt. After they're launched out, we cut to Jimmy and his classmates at school. I'm never getting sick again. That wasp sting really hurt. One little sting? Try 678 needles and then talk to me about pain. No more leeches, mama. No more leeches, mama. No more leeches, mama. At the end of the episode, we see Ms. Fowl introducing a new student who has a cold and is sneezing a whole lot, while all the other kids start panicking and running away from the new girl. Now, there's a few inventions we see in this episode, the hover car and the shrink ray, but the big one I'm focusing on is that sick patch. This thing would be a massive game changer. Imagine being a kid and being able to stay home sick whenever you want. I would have absolutely abused the hell out of this thing. When I was a kid, I loved getting sick because I would stay home all day and just relax and forget about the stress of school. But imagine being able to use that as an adult. Like, imagine being forced into a situation that you don't want to be in and being able to just use this patch to immediately make yourself look sick so you could get out of it. It's the perfect excuse to get out of anything. If you're lucky, it'll even get you out of work too. I'm sure many of you would probably abuse the hell out of this thing just like I would. Next up, we're diving on into the Season 2 episode, Nightmare in Retroville. This one begins with Jimmy, Carl, and Sheen hanging out in Jimmy's pre-lab fort as they discuss what they want to be for Halloween. The time has come for a momentous decision which will affect us all forever! What are we gonna be for Halloween? Llama Boy! Carl! You've been Llama Boy for the last eight years. Yeah, plus Llama Boy is not scary. He's just creepy. You're supposed to be scary on Halloween. Sheen says that this year he wants to be something really scary as the boys head inside. They walk past Jimmy's dad, who's watching his favorite scary movie, Octopus Man, and they decline his offer to join him as they head right into Jimmy's room. So, who are you going to be this year, Jim? Albert Einstein? Jet Fusion? That smart guy in the wheelchair that talks with a keyboard? Actually... I'm not going to trick-or-treat this year. <gasps> I don't know, Halloween 
Halloween's kind of for kids. But we are kids, and it's Halloween. Yeah, Jimmy. Think of the bubble gum, the tiny chocolate bars, the artificial flavors, red dye number five, and it's all free. Jimmy tells them that he isn't going to be dressing up this year because he feels like Halloween is for little kids. However, Jimmy doesn't want to miss out on the candy, so he makes a proposition to them that if he makes them extra scary, then he gets 25% of their candy. You think I'm a fool? Call it 50, we got a deal. Deal! To the- oh, oh, Jimmy, can I say it this time, please? All right, Carl, go ahead. To the place where Jimmy has all his neat stuff and where he invents things and then something goes wrong and we have a big adventure! To the land! Jimmy shows them what he calls his 27th greatest invention ever, the Neutronic Monster Maker. You select a monster, step under the cone of creation, and it'll realign your molecules to make you look exactly like that monster. Sheen immediately decides that he wants to be a werewolf before even seeing any of the other monsters. What about you, Carl? The Hunchback of Notre Dame? Uh, too hunchy. The Blob? Too blobby. The Phantom of the Opera? Too opera-y. Frankenstein? Frankenstein. No, I don't like his wardrobe. I'm more of a summer. <gasps> Who's the guy with the cape? Dracula. Yeah, he has a cape. I want to be Dracula. We see Jimmy power up the machine as he transforms Sheen into a werewolf first. Then he proceeds to turn Carl into Dracula, which basically makes Carl look goth. Jimmy uses his hover car to drive them to neighborhoods for trick-or-treating. Meanwhile, Hugh accidentally falls down into Jimmy's lab where he's just terrified that he fell into another dimension. Then he lays eyes on the monster maker. I have to stop for just a second and point out this machine and the monster that it's currently selected, which looks alarmingly like none other than Michael Jackson. <gasps> a big game? Oh, I want to play Name That Monster! Spin the wheel! Round, round, and round it goes! Where it stops, nobody knows! <laughs> you know, I bet if I pull this lever, something really fun happens! Where's my prize? Does it come out of that umbrella thingy? We then cut to inside the Neutron house, where we learn that Hugh has been transformed into Frankenstein. Well, there's no need to get in a huff. Now, will you light the jack-o'-lantern, please? I'll get my costume on. Oh, you're gonna love it! Be right back! <laughs> Fire back! Fire back! We cut back to Carl and Sheen, who are trick-or-treating their principal's house. As they're leaving, Carl goes to unwrap a candy, but accidentally cuts his finger on the wrapper. Just then, he starts sucking on his own bleeding finger. Mmm, mm, not bad. Tastes like cherry soda with a lot of vinegar in it. Mmm, mmm, boy, that is good. I mean, mmm, 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 that is really good. Hey, try some, you guys. It's way better than Purple Flurp. No way. I'm not drinking your blood. Yeah, no thanks, Carl. After that, we see Carl basically take on the persona of Dracula. His voice changes, and he transforms into a vampire bat as he flies away. Bye, you guys. See you later. That was weird. But totally awesome! I want to change to a bat! I want to fly! Make me a bat, Jimmy! Make me a bat! Jimmy then realizes that his monster maker altered Carl's structure on a subatomic level, which altered his DNA. And now again in English? He's a real vampire! Cool! Not cool! If Carl turned into a real vampire, then you could turn into a real... <gasps> Uh, Sheen, I think we better go back to the lab. Or not. Werewolf Sheen tries to attack Jimmy, but he flies off just in the nick of time. With Vampire Carl, Werewolf Sheen, and Frankenstein Hugh wandering the city, Jimmy realizes that he needs to come up with a plan to fix everything. As Jimmy's getting more info about werewolves and vampires from Goddard, a familiar voice chimes up in the distance. Even a man who is pure at heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf bane blooms in the autumn moon is mine! Uh, hi, Miss Fowl. How do you know about werewolves? I was married to one! She tells Jimmy about how he can use something silver to defeat the werewolf. Then she proceeds to disappear off into the fog. We cut back to Carl, who scares Cindy from behind and proceeds to hypnotize her by making her stare into his eyes. What is your blood type? 
A positive master. Mmm, how positively delicious! We then cut to Libby walking through the dark park at night as Sheen approaches her and he scares her. He starts asking her if she has any meat. Sheen, you're usually weird, but tonight you got a little extra going on. I need meat! Well, don't look at me. I'm a vegetarian. I knew it! Carlos, me two bucks. He thought you were a Republican. This joke totally flew over my head as a kid, and I just love it. We see Sheen jump at Libby to attack her, similar to how Carl did to Cindy. Meanwhile, Jimmy is flying in his hover car searching for them. We then cut back to Frank and Hugh, who is walking extremely slow outside of the candy bar. What on earth are you doing? <clears throat> I need you at home to help me pass out fruit snacks. <clears throat> me want you. Hugh, please use complete sentences. <clears throat> oh, don't mumble. You sound like you have a mouth full of marbles. <clears throat> oh, my! <laughs> Hugh! What are you doing? This isn't our rumble lesson night. Jimmy ends up flying up to Carl and Cindy, who we learned has been also transformed into a vampire from being bit by Carl. They jump to attack Jimmy. Uh, uh, hey, look! The Red Cross is having a blood drive! Where? Where? Make like a bet and follow me! Yes, master. Jimmy runs away as they turn into bats and chase him. Just when they catch him, we find out that Jimmy just so happened to stop in front of Lucky Tony's house of garlic. As Jimmy sneaks through an alley, trying to make it back to the lab, we see Sheen and Libby walk up behind him, seeming normal at first. Sheen must have bitten Libby! We're just good friends. And you better not have rabies! Don't worry, I've had all my shots! Thanks for turning me into a werewolf, Jimmy! It's awesome! Oh, except for the fleas. Hey, Sheen, you said we were going to get something to eat. How about Jimmy? <laughs> Similar to how it happened to Carl and Cindy, turns out Jimmy stopped in front of the Hi-Ho Silver Jewelry Store, which scared the werewolves away. Then, he sees his parents walk past, and he learns that his dad's been transformed into a monster. As Jimmy's trying to talk to his parents, Carl walks up. Hey, Mrs. Neutron, you look so pretty and full of blood. Why, thank you, Carl. What? Look into my eyes, please. Ah, she mine! Take a number, Flathead. Ah, 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 I'm ah, going to bite you in the neck! Here I go! Ow! As they're fighting, Sheen shows up and gets involved into the fight, as do Cindy and Libby. In the midst of all the fighting, Mrs. Neutron yells at everyone before she storms off. You should be ashamed. Now you work this out among yourselves, I'm going home to hand out fruit snacks. I'll see you later, Hugh Neutron. She's right. Why are we attacking each other? We're monsters. We should be going after innocent townspeople. Who wants to rampage through town? Yeah! Let's go! Back at Jimmy's lab, we see him lower the frequency of the machine as he transforms himself into a monster as well, but due to the lower frequency, it won't alter his DNA. As the monsters start to go after the townspeople, they form an angry mob with garlic, fire, and silver spoons to ward off the monsters. As the monsters are hiding from the angry mob, Jimmy appears to fight them off, having turned himself into Octopus Man, the monster from his dad's favorite scary movie. Jimmy uses his suction cups to carry all of the monsters back to his machine, and he transforms them back into their human state. Hey, I don't want to drink blood anymore. Yuck, me neither. Huh, I've lost all desire to consume human flesh. Uh, uh, hey, I can speak in complete sentences. Now where's my scary little sugar booger? Right here, you monster. <laughs> <laughs> Who's up for banana balls and prune puffs? Okay. Everyone's sad that they didn't get any candy, but Jimmy, who is still Octopus Man, says that he can fix that, as he uses all eight of his tentacles to ring doorbells and he trick-or-treats for them, and that's where the episode ends. First of all, I just gotta say, the spooky episodes of this show are some of my favorite episodes, and this one is no exception. The invention that we're focusing on, of course, is the Monster Maker. When used at a lower frequency so that it doesn't alter your DNA, this thing is seriously awesome. The idea of getting transformed into a monster is really cool for Halloween specifically, but doesn't have much of a use outside of that unless you're like a Scooby-Doo villain or something like that. However, if Jimmy could program it to turn you into a different person, that would be absolutely mind-blowing. Imagine using this machine to turn yourself into like 
I don't know, Jeff Bezos or some super rich and powerful person, the possibilities are endless. Even further, what if he could program it to alter DNA, but instead of changing it into a specific person, you could use it to change things physically about yourself. Like, alter your DNA to get rid of acne prone skin, or to make your hair grow more full if you're balding. There's a risky and a fine line to be walked there, but you gotta admit the concept of it all is pretty astounding. Definitely not my all time favorite invention on this list, but it's worth enough to be mentioned in this list to begin with. Also, I love Halloween, and I would totally use this to turn myself into a monster and wander around one of those haunted house attractions or something. Last, we are going to focus on an invention that has been featured in nearly every episode that we've talked about so far, and that's going to be Jimmy's dog, Goddard. Goddard is man's best friend, constructed to fit every need that Jimmy could possibly have and then some. He's intelligent, he's loyal, and he's equipped with nearly every device needed to save Jimmy in a pinch. The episode we're going to check out is the Season 3 episode, Best in Show. This one starts out at the Retroville Pet Show. The judges have the kids take turns showing off their pets, starting with Butch, who shows off his Japanese fighting fish, Yoko. When the judge points out that it should probably be in the water, Butch runs off and Sheen shows up excitedly, eager to show off his pet. Me next! Say hello to Tito, the dancing worm! Watch closely as he does the twist, the macarena, and the funky chicken! This worm is not moving. Uh, he's taking a nap. He was up late last night rehearsing. There he goes! Dance, Tito! Dance! Yeah, nice try, Sheen. Next! Wait, keep watching! He's gonna turn into a butterfly or an eagle or something! Next up is Carl, who shows off his stuffed llama, saying that it's his pet, but then Butch comes up and rips its head off. <laughs> It's Bulby time! Bulby win contest with Yuri the Musical Gold! 5, 8, 2, 12! Butch then proceeds to sabotage Bulby by blowing pepper at his goat. Up next is Cindy, who shows off her dog Humphrey, who's actually pretty well trained. He can sit, roll over, and even sing jazz. That was my mother's favorite song. Incredible! The judges are blown away by Cindy's dog. Up next is Jimmy, though, who shows off all of Goddard's amazing talents that, of course, Jimmy has programmed into him. The judges decide that Jimmy's the winner, but Cindy protests, saying that Jimmy shouldn't be able to win because Goddard isn't a pet, he's a robot. One of the judges looks over at the rules and decides that Goddard has been disqualified, leaving the win to Cindy and her dog. We then see Jimmy and his friends walking home as Jimmy and Goddard are feeling bad. Sheen, don't make Goddard feel bad! It's not his fault he's not a real dog so he couldn't win that cool trophy. Jimmy, we'd love to console you in this time of great disappointment, but Cindy's throwing a party to celebrate! This would be yours if you had a real dog! Later that night, we see Goddard having nightmares of everyone saying that he isn't a real dog. Not 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 a real dog. Goddard decides to leave a note by Jimmy's pillow as we see him walking down the street into the night. Jimmy wakes up and checks the note, which was left in binary code. Jimmy translates it. Dear Master, sorry I let you down. You'd be better off with a real dog like everyone says, your ex-pet Goddard. He ran away! Access Goddard tracking device! Ah, he, he decommissioned his tracking device! Goddard! We cut to Goddard, who we see walking down the street, just looking sad. He goes to the park and tries to play with a guy who looks like Skeet from McSpankies, but when he obliterates the tennis ball that the guy throws, he runs off scared. Then Goddard keeps going and he tries to play with a baby at the park, but he proceeds to scare the mother when he flies off with the baby. We then cut to Jimmy and his friends looking for Goddard. Jimmy! Jimmy! There he is! That's a tree. Sorry. Oh! There he is! That's another tree. There he is! Oh, nope. That's a tree. That's Miss Fowl! Hmm, maybe that optometrist was right. We cut back to Goddard, who's flying around with the baby as the mother's freaking out. He safely flies the baby back down to its mother, and the mother tells a nearby cop that she wants Goddard destroyed. 
We then see the cop driving with Goddard as he takes him to the pound to have him put down. Got a mad dog for you, Pitch. Need to put him, uh, D-O-W-N-E. That isn't a dog, it's a robot. Take him to the recycling plant. And where exactly would that be? Don't feel bad. Why, you might be turned into a soda can, and someday I may drink out of you. Meanwhile, we see Cindy walking Humphrey, who fails to live up to his Pet of the Year award by chasing a nearby cat, and Cindy is in the street chasing him. Oh no! Goddard! <laughs> Rescue mode! <laughs> Looks like my fancy machine saved your life, Vortex. After Goddard saves Cindy's life, she storms off angrily after Jimmy tries to get her to apologize. We cut back to the park where the pet contest was, as Goddard's being awarded a trophy for saving Cindy, and he's recognized as a real dog and an amazing pet. Hey, Tito just saved my life! Can I get a trophy too? You're way too near me. Goldie, make Yuri play celebration song! Kick it, Yuri! Ah. <laughs> ah! My eyes! Okay, this isn't funny anymore! Not that it was funny before! All right, maybe the first time, but much less so the second time, and now it's really getting tiresome and very painful! This episode is one that really made me appreciate Goddard more than any other episode did. Seeing him hurt by everyone saying that he isn't a real dog really hit my soft spot. I love Goddard, he's such a good boy and he's always there when Jimmy needs him. Without a doubt, I'd say that Goddard is Jimmy's all-time greatest invention. Not only is he a fantastic companion and friend, but he's also a nifty invention that's equipped with nearly anything you would need in a pinch. I can't give enough praise to Goddard. Jimmy's inventions, more often than not, have a downside. There's usually some way that they backfire or tend to fail in some way, shape, or form. Goddard, on the other hand, is the most trusty invention that Jimmy has ever made. Hands down, even though this list isn't in any particular order, I had to save the best one for last, and Goddard is hands down the absolute best. But what do you think? Is Goddard your favorite invention of Jimmy's? If not, what is your favorite invention? Let me know in the comments down below. I always love reading feedback from you guys. If you enjoyed this video, drop a like and give praise to the YouTube algorithm in hopes that it promotes this video to everyone else. If you aren't yet, be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any of my future videos. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I will see you all in the next one. Peace.